everybody. Welcome to another episode of the TF Podcast, where we discuss technology, finance, and business uh, with individuals all over the world and talking interesting things about what's happening in the world, as well as uh, what they've been up to. And so with that, I'm very excited to welcome today's guest, who is Matt Conwell. Uh, you might know him on Twitter as Mac the VC. And so with, uh, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself to everybody, please. How's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is McKeever Edward Conwell II. I go by Mac. Everybody on Twitter knows me as Mac the VC. Uh, I am a college dropout, a former government contractor as a software engineer for seven years, uh, two-time startup founder with one exit and one failure, and now I do investing. Nice, nice. So um, let's kind of dig back in there. So you're you, 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 you proud of the college dropout because that's like what led you to be where you're at, right? Like you you went through that, you went ahead and probably started working on some ideas and, and then that's, is that what got you into uh, software engineering or were you doing software engineering? Is that why you dropped out or kind of walk yeah, so that? Uh, so what happened was uh, I grew up doing um, a lot of engineering things. Like, you know, all the after school programs I was in was like all educational stuff. That's what my parents were all about. And so I was all about engineering. And so when I went to school, I ended up going to Morgan State, a small HBCU here in Baltimore. And when I went to school, I was like, okay, I want to build robots that are one day going to be on the moon. So what's the major I need to do to build robots? And somebody told me computer science, because the computer science club, had a, had a, like in the computer science department, they had a robotics club. I was like, sure, great. I had no clue what computer science was or what it meant, right? Sure. So I got lucky on that part, right? So I, I get there, I take my first class and like the robotics club thing doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, but I took my first class. I was like, ah, oh, this stuff isn't too hard. I checked out how much computer science is made at the time. This is in 04. And uh, I was like, yeah, this is my major. That works. Like, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so my plan was to do that, get a degree, get my master's, and then go get a find a job. But my sophomore year, I got an internship with the DOD, and I got top, and I got a top secret clearance, which meant uh, a division of Northrop Grumman offered me a job making a whole bunch of money my junior year. So bye bye school. Yeah, I mean most people <laughs> this go. This is to basically school. how that happened. Most people go to school to get a well paying job, and so if you yeah, if that's you, exactly you, what it was. Yeah, no, that's great. So, um, and you said you're, you're a former founder, uh, walk mm -hmm. me through that. What, what were the projects or what were the things that you had worked on? Yeah. So my first startup was a company called, um, uh, no bad gift.com later given to, and we started off as a platform to crowdfund money for gifts, which was really cool. But this, we started in like 2010 and around that time, there was just a lot of stuff in like what they call the social gifting space. Yeah. Um, and, um, Facebook actually went on to buy the biggest competitor in the space and everybody knew Facebook gifts was coming. Like for whatever reason, gifts, gifting was interesting at that time. Yeah. And so um, me and my two co-founders had no clue what we were doing, right? We just thought we were building a website that could make money. Like we didn't know what a starter was. We didn't know what accelerator or incubator was. We didn't know what investors were. Like we were just three guys building. Just learning by doing. Yeah. So like eventually along the way, we realized we didn't have any customers. We're like, yeah, we need to do some marketing. We're like, well, we don't have money for marketing. Well, these things called these, there's these people called investors. They give you money so you can do marketing. I'm like, okay, so we need to go find investors. That kind of like, that conversation literally is what started me down the path of burning all this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, going to events, networking, and all that other stuff. Um, but along the way, we did two accelerators. We did one in Baltimore, one in San Francisco. And while we were out in San Francisco, like, no investor was interested in us. Gifting was oversaturated. And so we need to different. So we just figured we need to differentiate ourselves. And so we figured out a way for people to, um, we figured out a way to prepay for things from the iTunes store mm. and distribute the people in the form of like links. So you could like buy a paid version of Angry Birds and send it to somebody in a text message for their birthday as a gift. Nice. And when they click the link, it would just download to their device. Yeah. So we started doing demos and we realized nobody had seen anything like that before. And so we quickly pivoted to just doing that. So we, you could programmatically pick up, you could programmatically buy anything out of the iTunes store and distribute it in the form of a link, whether it be on Twitter, Facebook, text, what have you. And we started selling that technology off to, um, to like uh, enterprise clients who did like loyalty and rewards type stuff. Sure. And so after four and a half years of that, a fortune 100 company, a division of a fortune 100 company ended up buying the technology from us, which was really cool. Um, my second company, uh, Redberry, was online, it was an e-commerce platform where basically 
I had realized there were a bunch of people selling on Instagram, but they were selling through email and text messages. Yeah. Right? And it was like, well, that's a painful process, but they were making thousands of dollars a day. So even though it's a painful process, there were enough people still wanting to do it. So I was like, sure. okay, we can, we can make a better, you know, we can make a better mousetrap than that. So basically what we did was we basically were out to build a Twitter, um, not Twitter, uh, Instagram clone that we have, we have nothing but products and every product will have a buy button, but we had a slew of products on the back end for sellers. So it was like, we were making a whole bunch of things for sellers on the back end and we didn't care anything about the consumers because like the consumers were the fans, they were the followers, they were going to come regardless. What we needed was to get the sellers all the tools they needed to sell better on mobile. Um, I put a team together really quickly. We signed up a bunch of sellers pre-launch. I was able to raise an angel round. I went to another accelerator. And while I was in that accelerator, my team fell apart. So that company failed. So I had a hit in the law and a fail. So yeah. that's how that went. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's, uh, you know, so I actually have a, a quite a strong background in commerce and loyalty as well. So I, mm -hmm. when you're saying all this stuff, I was like, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? Like just like the programmatic ads or programmatic, uh, you know, commerce essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. Super interesting. I, and it's funny because like as a result of spending, my, my background has been in retail tech. Um, I find I like relate that to everything I do here on out. So like even like how I think of the value exchange, you know, between individuals or the value exchange between like how an investor and a founder might, you know, communicate, right? Like there's like these elements of loyalty or these elements of um, like how you are uh, retaining them as a customer, as a user, but uh, you know, being top of mind, right? So right. It's, it's super, super interesting to think through that. Um, so what has got you interested now where you're at, where you're, you know, you're interested more on like the venture side of things and like, you know, so you're Mac the VC now. So wh where did that transition hit for you? Where you're like, okay, I'm, I don't necessarily want to build companies right now. I want to, I want to build or support founders and them building companies. What, what was that transition for you? Um, I think every founder believes they have the ability to be an investor, right? Like every, every entrepreneur feels like, yeah, I, I can pick oh, up a true. company. I mean, I want to um, be a VC one day too. <laughs> so. yeah. Every founder feels that way. Um, but I think there's more to it than just, I think it's more to it than what we think as founders, right? The thing that helped me was I spent a lot of time trying to understand how investors thought, because I figured if I could get into the mind of an investor, it'd be easier for me to pitch them, right? And that would prove to be really valuable for me. I also helped a lot of other entrepreneurs along the way raise money and learn how to pitch and how to meet investors and things like that. And I built up a fairly strong brand doing that. And so um, after my second company failed, I had to go get a day job that was pretty terrible. Um, and I eventually found like there's a, 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 a local firm where I am in Baltimore, or Maryland, that was hiring. I knew somebody there, so I called them up. I was like, hey, you think I'd have a shot? Because I don't have a finance background. I don't have a college degree. But I do have startup background. I have a really strong brand in the community. And so uh, I took a shot, and I, I applied. And after the four months of interviewing, they, they brought me in, right? Um, and so it's been, it's been interesting, you know, all the things I thought about VCs as a founder, like half of them are false and half of them are true, right? Yeah. <laughs> like some of it's real, some of it's not. <laughs> Let's um, get into that. <laughs> right. Like, like, like I think, oh, yeah, investing's easy. It's not easy. Like it's, you see so many companies and you have to turn so many companies away. And one thing, and like anybody who follows me on Twitter, you'll see like, I talk a lot about the process of being a VC and what VCs think about and what, and what VCs are looking for. Because what I learned is like at the end of the day, VCs are just money managers, right? We're not special. There's nothing unique about what we do. We just literally manage money for rich people or essentially, right? That's, that's our jobs. Mm. And so we are picking companies purely for the idea of return on investment. And so what a lot of founders don't understand or don't know is like they don't get to see our world. And we have it like behind this veil and it's supposed to be like secretive. I think it's all bull. Like, you know, this isn't that hard to understand. We just need to talk to founders about it and be honest with founders about the process. Like founders get mad at us because like, well, oh, my company's so great. You know, my competitor raised all this money. They have less traction than me. How come? how come I can't raise money <laughs> because you never know the backstory about all that stuff. Right. Right. Like whenever you see a company raise a bunch of money pre product or pre revenue, 
typically there's a backstory that most entrepreneurs will never hear and it has more to do with their network or their experience. Exactly. Like, like in that TechCrunch article that talks about this company raising a bunch of money for a stealth company that's pre-product, which you don't know, like the two founders have both also founded three other companies that you've never heard of. Uh, one of them got funded that failed that you never heard of, but they built up some strong relationships with investors who are just willing to bet on them again. Right. Wow. Like you don't get those pictures. You don't get to know those stories. Yeah. So for the, for the entrepreneur, it just feels like, oh, this game is completely rigged. And to an extent it is. But there's so much more that happens behind the scenes that you never hear that leads a lot of founders to be hurt and bitter. I mean, I used to be one of those founders. Right. Like I just didn't understand why right. nobody would want to invest in me. Well, it's like breaking in. Right. So kind of to what your point there is, um, you know, I have a founder friend who his company failed and he told me he's like man i was so surprised because i was i was nervous to talk to my investor about the company failing and his investor not not all of them but this particular one said well what's the next one let me know what the next one is and, and we'll 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 figure it out so meaning like in that and in that investor's mind i mean it's just more like he he already is, is assuming that most of his deals are going to fail so he just wants to like put more fuel in the fire, right? Where someone else might be more risk averse and be like, oh, well, you failed once. I'm sorry, I'm not touching you type of thing. So it's, right. it's definitely really interesting there. I think the other thing too is um, founders sometimes don't realize, you know, and I'm a founder and, and, and so founders don't sometimes don't realize that you're not only are you competing with, you know, someone similar in your space, but you're competing for like 20 other spots, right? Or, or 10 other spots or six other spots, depending on like how many deals that VC writes a year, right? So it's like, not only do you have to be like the best company in your vertical or space, but you also have to be the best company out of, you know, six to 20 deals, depending on the on how many uh, deals that, that VC writes or checks that VC so I need you to get out my head because that's literally a tweet I'm gonna I'm gonna put out later today. <laughs> like I I've actually been plotting on putting out this tweet all day um, about that exact point. Because to your point, like what founders don't understand, is like yes, you're competing against your competitors in your space, but you're also competing against all the other founders I'm seeing before I make this investment, right? And so right. let's say I make an investment a quarter, like one investment a quarter. On any given month, I'm gonna see anywhere from a hundred to three hundred companies. So in any given quarter, I'm going to see anywhere from 300 to 1,000 companies. And out of that, I'm going to invest in one. Right. And so you're not only competing against the companies in your space, you're also competing against the companies I'm seeing in that time frame. Yeah, yeah. And so like, where do you stack up against all the other companies I'm seeing in that time frame? And as well as where you stack up in your vertical. Yeah. And does your and is your vertical big enough to get me back venturable returns and all this other yeah. stuff? Right. So like you gotta go against all of that. And then it's funny, so I did an AMA about a month ago, and I'm gonna do another one later this month, where one of the founders asked, What is the single most important thing an investor looks for when he's meeting the company, right? And I laughed because I'm sure the founder was expecting me to say something like team or market, none of that. As an investor, the thing that matters the most to me more than anything else is do I believe you have the potential to make a hundred million dollars in revenue in the next like five to 10 years? Because if you can get to a hundred million in revenue, that means you can get to a billion dollar valuation. Yeah. If you can get to a billion dollar valuation, you can return me a bunch of money. Like more than anything else, that is the most important thing for every investor. I don't care what they tell you. I don't care sure. what they say. Sure. At the end of the day, you need to have the ability to return my entire fund or close to it. Exactly. Well, because otherwise it's charity, right? And so it's like, hey, like, and, and like, hey, like, I'm going to make a charitable investment or a charitable donation to this startup because, like, you know, I want to be a nice person. No, no, no. At the end of the day, is like, will this make money and return my capital to the LP? <laughs> like, it, it, yes. is, that, is that it? So no, That's I totally exactly agree. Really I wanted to kind of go back really fast on like the um, what we were talking about with competing against other deals because I have like this silly analogy like I always like to give. You might like this. So okay, you know it's like the the most basic way you can describe this is like hey like I want to go out to eat at a restaurant and I feel like eating Mexican food. So I go to like the local you know to downtown area, and I could. It's not like I'm going to decide between um, just 
Mexican food that's on that block, right? So like I'm going to decide between all the Mexican food in that area. But then as I'm looking, I'm like, oh, you know what? Italian food sounds kind of good right now or whatever, you know, like you start thinking about all these other things. So not only are you competing with like the same food restaurant in your same type of food, you're competing with all restaurants in your area because something easily can grab your attention or something can like, you know, hey, like actually like, I don't know. But but Vietnamese food sounds really good right now. You know what I mean? So right. <laughs> that's a silly analogy, but it makes a lot of sense. It's not silly, and it makes sense, right? Because also, while you're doing that process, you're also thinking about how much does it cost, right? So you're also doing cost analysis along right. with it, right? Yeah. So for the same thing, when I'm talking to startups that I like, there may be a couple startups that I like, but some of them, the the valuation are going to be higher than the others. And like your valuation may be the reason why I don't invest in you. Like if your valuation is too high, I might be like, I can't, I can't play in that space. Yeah. Your, your valuation is too high. I'm not going to be able to get enough equity in the company. I'm sorry. Right. Right. Um, so like it, all those things fit into play. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because there's, um, you know, you definitely hear a lot of founders complain about, you know, Hey, VCs and, and, or investors and vice versa, right? You know, there's good founders and there's bad founders. There's good VCs and there's bad VCs or, or, and it's more, I think than anything. Um, if I was to say like, kind of like the, the biggest problem that founders will do is they'll often um, make impressions or sorry, they'll share the impressions about VC though they're not necessarily reflecting that they might not be ready either, right? So like meaning like, oh, like I'm not getting any intention from VCs and this is rigged. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe, but also like maybe you're just not 100% ready just yet, right? Like you're, so I, I think there's this notion that people forget that it's not like, hey, I'm going to call it Ben Horowitz, even though I love Ben Horowitz. It's not, if I call it Ben Horowitz and be like, yo, can I like go to coffee with you? He's probably going to say no because he doesn't know me from Adam, but go ahead and meet me, Ben Horowitz, because you're my favorite. Uh, <laughs> anybody that like consistently uh, uh, talks about hip hop music in relation to investing, to me is just like, I just really like, <laughs> anyways, but like, it's just not going to happen, right? And so I think people also need to understand that is that it's, um, it's, uh, it's a slow, it's a process, right? Like, like you were saying a moment ago, it's all about your invest, your network, creating that network, taking the time of that network. It's not going to happen between one day and, and the next day. When you met your spouse, you know, chances are you didn't see that person and say like, Hey, let's get married today. The first day I get to talk to you, <laughs> right? right? If you did, they would have thought you were a crazy person. So why, why would it be different in any other type of relationship? Pretty much into the whole founders being mad, but they might not be ready. What happens is a lot of time investors tell entrepreneurs they're not ready or they're too early and they never explain what that means right. or what it means to them, right? Um, I try my best when I meet founders to, to really talk to them and tell them like, hey, you're too early and this is what that means and this is what my perspective is as a VC and why you're too early. And I find that to be wildly helpful for companies, for founders, and also find that some founders get upset by that, right? But yeah. like, if I'm not going to be honest with you and tell you the truth, I'm not helping you, right? But some VCs fear the, I don't know if fear is the right word, but some VCs don't want to tell you all those things because one, you might go out and do all those things and I still not invest in you, but then there's only so much money I have, I can only pick so many companies, right? The other thing is, if I tell you all these things, and you're not happy with my answer, you may never talk to me again. Right. If you have I can't ever be in the place next time or whatever. Yeah. Right. I can't be in a place where you never talk to me again. Because if you build another company or if your company starts to get better, I need you to come back to me so I get a chance to make that investment. Yeah. So you know, I'm going to care about your feelings just so that we can keep a relationship going. Because what is what's happening in actuality is that those investors aren't telling you the truth because they're making a bet on the founder that you have the ability to potentially do better. Yeah. So it's actually, they're making a bet on you that you could do better than what you're currently doing. But at the same time, they're hurting you because they're not giving you the honest answer of where you are. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an interesting point of view, right? Because it's like, it's, it, yeah, the biggest problem there exactly is that, Hey, they hurt your feelings or, or whatever. And then you don't, but like I had a conversation with an investor the other day and um, it was funny because I know him, like we, we actually live close, close by. And uh, he goes, 
I hope like what I said in that email, like you didn't, it didn't, I'm like, no, man, like, like pile it on. You know, I, I want to know exactly why you don't like something. I was like, I'd be offended if you, if you told me like it was just not for you and you didn't give me any, uh, any feedback on it. Like that would be more offensive than you beating it up. Like I want you to be, it doesn't, and by the way, just cause you beat it up doesn't mean I have to agree with it or, or not. Right. Like it's up to me to then reflect on that and be like, okay, like he's right there. Like I told, yeah, I can see why he came up with this point or like, no, I can refute those points, but let me, let me check that back. Right. Let, let me double, double check and see if, uh, let me validate that. Right. Let me, let me see if he, that is true. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, founders, if, I think if founders think about it that way, they get a better understanding of it. And, you know, you can flat out just ask an investor, like, so what does that mean? Or like, from your perspective, why am I too early? Some investors will tell you, some won't, right? If you ask me, I'll tell you. Right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't mind if what I tell you hurts your feelings because it's never going to come from a place of being mean or being angry or not wanting to be supportive. It's coming from a place of, I used to be you. <laughs> yeah. I tried to raise money for a year and a half and couldn't figure out why until I realized, oh, it's because I don't have enough customers. Well, how come nobody ever told me that before? And everybody's like, well, we kept telling you were too early. That's basically what we meant. Like, but yeah, but that wasn't helpful. Like, I, if somebody had told me earlier, like, just focus on getting the customers and we'll give you money, I would have probably had way more customers. I might actually have raised money. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. not. Like, <laughs> I'd have tried better. <laughs> No, I think that's smart. I mean, one thing I what, I what I do and I recommend for my founder friends is like if someone says that or too early or they say, you know, something like that, it's like, well, is there a metric that you're looking for that makes this interesting? Doesn't mean you'll invest, but like, is there something that you're looking for that then all of a sudden makes this interesting? And that's kind of a good place to put a VC or an investor in because if they if there isn't anything then that can kind of show you like well they're probably just not interested in the deal at all right like it's not right. necessarily it's too early it's just they, they're just not interested in the deal or if there's like like you know what like if this had I don't know a million customers like then this becomes interesting okay now you know that like there might be some level this still doesn't mean that they'd write a check but at least you know right. like that there's something there right so you know I think it's I think it's interesting you know, move, moving on to like a, kind of the opposite side of that is, um, you know, on the founder complaining side is, you know, it, it seems like often there is, uh, I think more early founders or first time founders experience this as like you've founded multiple companies, then you know how to weed it out is you have your, you know, prolific angels or these, or, or investors or VCs that write lots of checks, but then you have your folks that don't write checks or they write very, very few checks and they more just like to hear or feel important, right? And so you have these founders pitching folks that will just never do a deal for them um, anyway. And so, you know, kind of what are, you, what are your thoughts on that when, when you see that or like ways for founders to avoid that altogether or like, you know. Part of that's just part of the game, right? Like you're going to pitch to a bunch of people, especially if you're early, you're just going to pitch to a bunch of angels. Yeah. What I would say is the one thing I would tell founders to be careful of is you want to make sure you're pitching somebody who's made investments before, right? And somebody who's been burned before. Because what you who's don't want is like a first, yeah. Because what you don't want is an investor who's never been here, never been burned before, and they not know or understand how this works. Yeah. So now you got this one investor who's calling you every two weeks, like, hey, what's my update? Hey, how are things going? Hey, how's yeah. my money doing? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like you don't want that. Um, Early on in my first company, uh, one of my co-founders had um, his family member. He had a family member, a friend of the family who was a doctor who was like interested in like making an investment. Just, you know, he had money sitting around. He wanted to make an investment, a fairly sizable investment too for one, for one off angel. And I was like, no. Now, could we have used that money? Yeah, we could have really used that money. But he had never done investment before. He thought it was cool. So like yeah, we know, had no clue. Right how he was going to react or like what he would want from us. And like, if we didn't move as fast as he thought we could have, how that could have impacted us. Right. Like those are the kind of headaches you just don't need. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. I had a similar situation where a family member wanted to come in on, uh, on a company and I go, I need you to know that there's a possibility that you would never see this money again. And so like, and ultimately like, you know, we, it, it, we didn't have them come in the deal, but it's like, I had to, I had to be like that up front. Like if you don't see this money ever again, like that can't affect our relationship. You know what I'm saying? Because like, this is, right. this is a high risk investment of, of venture scale, right? We're not talking about like, I don't know, 
creating an ice cream shop that we know that is going to return X dollars and it's not going to be like massive profit, but it's going to just consistently contain and you get to get some dividend. It's not that, right? Like we're, we're hit, trying to hit a home run here. And that's why I think there's also a lot more room for more investors to do revenue-based investing, you know, profit sharing and dividends, you know, the stuff they're doing at Earnest Capital, the stuff they're doing with Colab in Atlanta, um, that stuff is really is really interesting because it allows for different class of companies and it also gives you an alternative to raise money without having to give up you know equity per se right sure um so i think there's i think there needs to be more of that and i think we're going to see in the future and coming years um a rise of that and a rise of hybrid funds who do a little yeah. bit of both yeah well, to, you know, to go along, I, I'm just, I love analogies. I apologize. But like, so to go along with that, when you think about VCs, like VCs want home runs or grand slams, right? But like, there's plenty of bait. If we're going to go with baseball, I actually hate baseball, by the way. But there's, there's plenty of baseball players that make a living by just hitting singles every time. They mm -hmm. bunt, they get on base, right? And like, they have some mm -hmm. of the biggest contracts or they're, they're known as some of like the best players because even though they get singles, they drive runs in, right? They, they, they bring people in the game. And so the reason I'm even bringing that up is because, uh, you know, as a founder, uh, your company doesn't have to be a multi-billion dollar company, right? Like to have a successful Perfect. business, it doesn't need to be that, um, you know, and not every company makes sense in that realm anyway, right? So um, yeah. sometimes people want to raise venture and not realize like there's not a a grand slam opportunity here, but it's going to be lots of singles and those singles are going to make lots of money. It's mm -hmm. just, that doesn't necessarily make enough money, m m enough of a situation for uh, a venture deal. Right. That's exactly what it is. There are plenty of great companies out there that aren't set to make venture returns, but then VCs are also, I think a lot of like VCs and people who've been doing this for a long time are just lazy. Um, there are industries that, that there are VCs who just don't understand, don't know, and just they they automatically make the assumption that it's just too small. Yeah. Especially in communities of folks that they don't understand, right? Oh, like, definitely. Like, like there, there are populations and communities that they don't know about, that they don't understand. They're just like, yeah, I don't see venture capital returns without ever actually looking into the actual numbers. Like, like this is supposed to be a numbers industry and the amount of VCs who actually don't look into the numbers are use faulty or old numbers totally. to make decisions. It's hilarious to me. Totally. Um, and so like, I also think, you know, I just fundamentally think a lot of VCs, especially some of the, I'll call it out, some of the top tier firms are just lazy. They, they, no, just, they, they, they have a model, the model works and that's what they do. And they never have to deviate from that model because that model's, just going to make money for them, right? It's printed money for them for years sure. and they'll just and, keep going. And look, it's hard to blame that from, if you, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're, if you are thinking in a strictly like numbers perspective, it's hard to blame like why you wouldn't deviate from that model, right? It's like, oh, I know that if I invest in Stanford and Harvard grads, like X will happen, right? And so, but that doesn't mean that there's not opportunity outside of Stanford and Harvard, right? And so like, I, I mean, I can understand the psychology, like why like that would perpetuate in such a way. But, you know, like you're saying, like there, there's so much opportunity to invest in founders from other backgrounds, other situations, you know, um, I have like this saying where I say like, your adversity is your superpower. Um, because like, like for me, like, like I said, I want to be a VC one day. And like the one question that I would ask every single founder is like, okay, I want to know, let me know a time you experienced adversity and how'd you come out of it? That's it. Like, that's like, that would be like my deciding question because what I like to say is that you're most likely, you must, you most likely have experienced a level of adversity in your personal life that is far more difficult than anything you'll experience as a founder. Right. And so like, if you can get through that. Um, then I know that like whatever we have, what happens in this business, like you'll be able to figure out, you know, like I, I saw a video of yours on your YouTube and you were talking about this woman who, uh, was trying to get funding and, and she couldn't get funding. And all of a sudden she's like, well, I'm gonna become a surrogate so I can have some money to like, that's crazy. Like that, that is super crazy. And I commend her for it. Like, that's the good crazy. Like I'm not, to me, crazy is not a bad word. Like that is amazing. Right. right? Like that someone would go through that. Um, and put their, their, it's a stress on your body, right? Everybody knows that when you carry a, a baby, that's stress on the body. And then uh, 
all to be able to achieve a dream that you're looking for. Like, I want to bet on that person. Like I'm, I'm putting money on that person because like I, if they're willing to do those things, like they're going to just keep, you know, I, I love it. I love, I love that story. Yeah. That's, um, that's my North star story is pinned on my Twitter. And, um, it's a heartbreaking story, right. To know that there was, she saw no other way to build her prototype and get things moving other than to become a surrogate. I mean, I have founders that I've invested in who sold their cars to get uh, uh, IP, right? Just to pay for a patent, they sold their car. A patent they actually, they probably didn't need, right? Right. Um, You know, I've, I've seen founders do crazy things to support their dreams because they lacked access to capital. And, um, and those founders are amazing people. And a lot of times they're, they're building products for communities that, again, a lot of investors just don't understand. They don't get, they just don't, don't get it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's frustrating at times, but you know, hopefully one day I'll get to be part of the solution. Yeah, no, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it, it seems like there's a shift where like that's starting to become more appreciated. Um, you know, some, some of these things are more appreciated, although I will say, um, this is just strictly my opinion. It feels as though some of the stuff that you see from like the quote unquote traditionals is more words right now, like less, less action. I'm like, I'm hoping it converts to action, but, um, it feels more word driven. (laughs) So, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Only time will tell. Only time will tell. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, from, from an investment space, um, are there particular uh, areas that you're interested in or is it more um, going back to like, Hey, I don't necessarily have to understand this space as long as I, I believe this could become hundred million dollar revenue. So I'm unique in the fact that I am very much described to kind of like the, uh, the original, like old school 500 startups way of thinking where I don't need to know a whole lot about your space. I mean, as long as you have the right size market, fine. What I care about more than just about anything is your customer acquisition strategy. Do you know how to get customers, right? Like that is the biggest thing. Um, One of my top performing companies in the portfolio of the firm I work at, when I met him, he was a 17 year old kid, like fresh out of high school. The reason why I wanted to make an investment in him because because what he was building at the time was never going to make money. Like the tool he was building at the time was never going to make enough money to make venture returns. But he got 25,000 users in three months using a hack that involved Venmo. He used a hack with Venmo to get 25,000 users. It's one of the smartest things I'd ever heard. And I just wanted to throw money at him. I, I was like, throw money at this kid. It took six months to get my firm to come around and to go through the process to, to get it done. He's gone off and raised close to, he's raised over 4 million now. He'll be like over five or six. He'll be looking to raise a much larger round next year, like a really big round next year. And he has some of the most amazing advisors in the FinTech space. Like it is an amazing FinTech company. Um, and he's, he's gone through YC and all this other stuff. And like all of that happened because we gave him a really early small check, we gave him 40 K check in like the beginning. But like the only reason I wanted to bet on that company was purely from this hack they did with Venmo. And I was like, yep, they're small enough to figure everything else out. So for yeah. me, I'm all about customer acquisition. Like, and if you can, then the more unique your customer acquisition strategy is, the more excited I'm going to be. <laughs> so like it could be in just about any industry. For me, but that's just, that's me personally, because like, I just see the difference that makes. And also for founders who think that way from the early onset of building their business, they tend to be out of the box thinkers, right? And so that means they get really creative about all the problems they run into. Cause you know, as a founder, like you're just gonna run into a ton of problems, like along right. the way, right? And like the more creative you can be about those problems, you know, the better off you can be. For sure. It's like that Mike Tyson quote, like everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? It's like, you, you know, you're going to get punched in the mouth. It's just being able to think through that. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's exactly how that happens. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, that, that, that's super interesting. And, and I totally agree. Like the customer acquisition piece is, is huge. Do you look for that in the deck? Like, are you expecting to see that in someone's deck? Um, no, because most founders don't, most, I, I would like to see it in the deck, but most founders don't put it there. So like, yeah. it's going well, to be, I, the conversation. Is, I don't, I don't know too many people that actually, actually, you know, they kind of more expect to talk about it, but I don't really see it in decks. Yeah, I don't see it in their decks, but also, you know, for me, like the first time you talk to me, I don't want you to pitch me with your deck. I just want to have a conversation. Like, I'm going to ask you the questions. We're going to get to the key points. Like, there's no reason for me to see your deck. Like, the deck is really for, like, ahead of time before we meet or if somebody wants to make an introduction and wants me to see your company before I talk or for me to send it to somebody else. But, like, my actual decision of whether I make an investment has going on almost have absolutely nothing to do with your deck. The yeah. deck is... It's to, it's to tell the story when you're not there. But when you're there, I don't need that. Like, you, we can have this conversation. Mac, you know, I'd like to go back to just, like, that conversation piece, right? You just said, hey, like, the first time we meet, I want to have a conversation. I don't want to be going over a deck. You know, I don't want, you probably don't even want to be pitched to, right? You more just want to be, like, talking and feeling that out. So kind of how, how does a founder do that? And, you know, if, so if I reach out to you and I'm like, hey, Mac, I want to talk to you about my company. How do I do that mm -hmm. in that way where I'm not just overselling you and, you know, being like a yappy dog trying to be like, hey, hey, hey you know, listen to me. What, what that takes practice, right? It takes practice and yeah. also depends on your personality, right? For some people, it's just not their personality. And I get that. But really, I'm going to do everything I can to make you comfortable. And I'm going to try and recenter the conversation as you go. So I'm actually telling me about your business. And as you start talking, at some point, if you're just overly talking, I'm going to stop you and be like, all right, so... Tell me, how, tell me how you make money. Tell me what your unit economics are. Tell me how you get customers. You know, tell me how large your market is. How did you come to that? You know, I'm going to try and, and prompt you along the way to prevent you from doing that. And if I catch you doing that and I, and I feel it, I will do my best to stop you along the way. I have had entrepreneurs where I'm trying to like recenter the conversation and just start, they just go back to doing it again. And like in those cases, there's nothing I can do. And I know part of it's because they're nervous. Part of it's they're overselling. Part of it's like, you're a VC, you could change my life. Like, don't think that way. I'm a person. We're having a conversation, right? Yeah. It'll make it easier for you as a founder and easier for me as the VC, right? Um, some people just want you to jump right to it, right? Some people want you to get to the deck and stuff. This is not me, right? So I don't want to discredit. There are other investors who are going to tell you like, hey, I just need to get right to the point. But for me, like, you know, let's, let's just have a conversation. Let me get to know you and know your business, right? That's, that's what's important. For me. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any startups out there that you're excited about? You know, just, just in general, you don't necessarily have to be invested in them, but like, is there anything out there that's like, you're like, man, I really like what this company is doing or, or how about a space? I mean, yeah, I, I, not any spaces, but you know, I got a couple of companies in my portfolio. I'm really partial to, so there's three of them. Scholar me, scholar me.co. They're amazing. They're a FinTech company to help students plan and pay for college. Remodel mate, get a new kitchen or bathroom in the click of a button. Um, they do a lot of stuff for, for helping with the remediation and making sure you get exactly what you want throughout the process and save you a lot of money. Like they can save you like up to 40% on the job. And then Elite Gaming Live, uh, after school esports program that incorporates STEM education. I'm really excited for them. So those oh, three in my portfolio awesome, like, that yeah, I'm excited like, about. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, hey, like if you do after school, you know, soccer, or after school basketball, why not after school gaming? Yeah. Yes. And as a former gamer, like that, 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 that appealed to me right off the bat. Like, I wish I had this when I was in school. Yeah, sure, for sure. Uh, well, Mac, uh, I have a closing question for you. It's a question that I ask everybody on my show, and that is, okay. what's a question that you have that you would like to ask our audience that they can think about as they go around about their day? What is your superpower? What is it about you that makes you so amazing that no matter what happens, whatever it is that you're creating today is going to be successful. Yeah. What is it? What is that? Right. Think about that and be able to articulate that well. And I think that'll help you go forward with your business. I love it. I love it. Totally. That's a great question. Great question. Mac, what are the best ways that people can stay in touch with you, follow what you're up to and so forth? Uh, the easiest way to stay in touch with me and follow me is follow me on Twitter. Um, my handle is Mac the VC. Uh, well, the, the the title is Mac the VC. My actual handle is Mac Conwell. M A C C O N W E L L. 
uh, follow me, engage with me. I tweet daily. You know, DMs are open. I don't get to all my DMs. My DMs are open. I don't get to all of them. I'm sorry for people who sent me DMs. I haven't responded. Like, I get it a lot. You know, there's a lot of ways people can get in contact with me. But I try to get to as many as I can. So. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much again for joining us on the show. Absolutely, man. This was fun. Yeah. Uh, everybody, thank you for listening to another episode of the TF Podcast. Please make sure that you are liked and subscribed wherever you're listening to this podcast. Um, we're also available on YouTube and appreciate if you subscribe there as well. You can follow us at, at TF Labs underscore, and you can follow me at JG Product on Twitter as well. And learn more at tflabs.io. Thanks so much, and we'll see you all soon.